All right, all the planeswalkers from uh, Phyrexia OLV1 are now out, and I'm going to be reviewing them today with uh, basically only the context of the current metagame and the cards themselves, with some like projection on what could possibly happen in the metagame. But uh, without full knowledge of the set, it's going to be hard to truly evaluate some of these, I'm assuming. But we'll, we'll find out. I'm just going to start with the... Uh, single color walkers and we'll move into the dual colors i'm going to start off with koth fire of resistance which is a four mana red planeswalker so two red two colorless four starting loyalty plus two search your library for a basic mountain reveal it put it in your hand then shuffle that's kind of weak i think i've gone over this in the past but uh yeah now seeing it again i can probably confirm that this is pretty weak unless there are a lot of benefits to actually getting mountains from your deck. It doesn't even put them on the field though. So maybe some kind of like discarding a card from your hand. A little bit difficult to really tell if this is going to be any good. But on face value, pretty bad plus. Minus three. Uh, this Planeswalker deals damage to target creature equal to the number of mountains you control. So there's like some mountain synergy there. So it's supposed to be played in mono red, but there's no real big mono red right now. It doesn't look like the, it even has the cards necessarily to actually support a deck like this. Maybe in this set, there will be some support for this kind of card, but it doesn't look like it on face value. And this card is especially, well, this effect, this minus three, is especially weak in a metagame with Planeswalkers. I mean, we're getting 10 new ones and it's already... A problem in this metagame kind of with the uh, cards like lily and uh wandering emperor already being pretty damn good planeswalkers right now so this is definitely a problem that it doesn't hit planeswalkers only hitting creatures is relatively weak for a planeswalker in general assuming you're getting four mana four damage it's doesn't even kill shield red Okay, minus seven, so if you plus twice, so you have two turns. The third turn, this is on the battlefield, you get to ult. Whenever a mountain enters the battlefield under your control, this emblem deals four damage to any target. So the, the key thing here is, is four damage, and it's not five. Again, we have some problems right now with shield red, especially, as I'm fixating on shield red. I feel like that's the biggest problem for mono red decks in general. So even the ultimate, and especially an ultimate that only procs off of a mountain entering the battlefield, and it's going to be difficult to get multiple mountains in a single turn because you can only play one line of turn on normal, uh, on a, in a normal situation. And that means you would be drawing a land unless you have a ton of cards in hand, which probably is not happening, but it could. So if you have a ton of lands in hand, that means you don't have spells. So essentially you're playing a mountain, dealing 4 damage, and then hoping that you have a spell to compensate for that. Like, 4 damage is not that much either, but I guess 3 turn ult is kind of average. And this Planeswalker is just underwhelming as hell, I feel like. Thanks for gifting the sub to Shudzi YW, <laughs> appreciate it. Overall, one of the weaker Planeswalkers that I've seen personally in my Magic the Gathering experience which is only like four and a half years so disappointing okay nissa got a seven mana but it's a completed planeswalker so it has two completed mana two completed uh phyrexian green mana so it's three colorless two green two phyrexian mana and essentially what you can pay the Frexian mana with a green or two life, and if you pay with life, it'll come in with two less loyalty counters. So if you pay for life, it'll be a five mana walker, but it'll come in... Wait. Wait for each, yeah. It'll come in with three loyalty, which is not great. So let's assume you're playing it for five, because usually Planeswalkers, you want to you wanna cub them... You want to bring them out as soon as possible. For five... We're doing plus, we're getting a 4-4, four, four, so it makes it XX, where X is Nissa's power, uh, loyalty. So it goes to 4 loyalty, you get a 4-4. Four, four. 
Minus one, destroy target artifact or enchantment. That is really good. Very good. Um, assuming you have three loyalty, go to two, which is not great. Very vulnerable, but the effect is strong. Or at minus one. The effect is strong. Unfortunately, I feel like this maybe should have been a zero. A minus zero. Or no, it, it would be just a zero. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's really strong, I think, to be able to deal with an artifact or enchantment. Moving into a metagame where we have more artifacts from the Brothers War. Or whatever the previous set was called, I kind of forget. Anyways. I guess we should talk about the ults because you can technically play this for seven and ult it immediately. And when you do, creatures you control get plus one, plus one for each forest you control, and they gain trample. So plus one, plus one scaling off of the amount of uh, forest you control and trample, very, very huge. Very huge, but no, it's quite good. That's quite good because the flexibility. If it was only 7 mana, minus 7, so it's situationally a uh, really, really good like uh, boost effect to your board, and you probably kill your opponent immediately on most board states. But even in the in the case where you don't have a cre uh, any creatures, well, you can plus and you can make it an 8-8, which is uh, humongous. <laughs> you can make an 8-8, and then the next turn you can minus and the 9-9. Nine -nine. Oh no, it's not just the 9-9. Nine -nine. It's, it could potentially be, assuming you're playing on 7, you have 8 mana, it could potentially be a 16-16 trample. That's pretty good, that probably kills your opponent. So overall, I would say this is pretty good. I think any Planeswalker that can make bodies protect itself is relatively valuable. Now, the, the issue I have with this is that you're paying 4 life to get it on 5. So on turn, for 5 mana, I would say it's it's a bit yikes. The four life in a meta game like this, where we have shield red, is not necessarily that good, and especially because green naturally struggles against shield red, it's kind of not. It's not solving that problem. And there's going to be invoke despair as well that will deal an extra two points of damage even with this down and a creature generated, and it will deal with this itself. So you're paying four life. They invoke, you lose two, so you you lost six, and you gave them a card off of a zero, off of nothing, essentially. So you just paid four for nothing. Yeah, I feel like as it stands, this would not cut it in this metagame, but green is getting a lot of stuff and it could potentially outpace the black decks. And uh, that's pretty much their only hope, I guess. <laughs> not, not too great right now on face value, I would say. But a pretty cool card. I just think losing life is just a really large cost right now. Eternal Wander. It's the, the white planeswalker. Six mana. So two white and four colors. Or a five loyalty planeswalker with a static. No more than one creature can attack the Eternal Wander in each combat. So I think I've already gone over this, but let's let's go over it once more and see if uh see if I'm still have the same opinion. Plus one, exile up to one target, an artifact or creature. Return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of that player's next end step. That's really good, especially with a static like this, which means you can essentially take one creature out of combat from your opponent's side, and it will only come into play at their end step, which is fantastic, and which means they can't attack Wanderer, the Wanderer with it. And only one creature can attack it anyways, but I guess it's more so for your attackers to be able to go through, or potentially you taking less damage face if you're behind. So it's very flexible, plus one's fantastic. Uh, zero, you make a 2-2 two, two with double strike. Pretty good. For a zero, that's fantastic. You're not losing loyalty. So it'll still be at five loyalty when it comes down. Essentially a four power creature. But uh, in white, you can potentially buff it with wedding announcement, maybe. That would be fantastic. And then the minus four, the ult, the pseudo ult, I guess it is, because you're not really working for it. But for each player, choose a creature that player controls... Each player sacrifices all creatures they control, not chosen this way. Um, yeah, this is interesting. I, I like that it doesn't lose all its loyalty from doing this. So it's like a pseudo sweeper where I think if you're playing this card in the first place, you're probably not playing an aggro deck. You're playing like a mid-range, uh, 
big white things deck like owl sanctuary warden and uh in that deck well obviously you don't really care about sacrificing your own side of the board you'll get to keep your biggest creature anyways and choose a creature that plays so so you can choose their smallest creature too so that's fantastic a lot of control on this card a lot of decisions you can make that are not left up to your opponent with this card and that's fantastic this card is really good but it's six mana so the problem is at six mana might be a little late in a meta game currently right now with uh, the counter spell why am i forgetting the name the casualty counter spell i don't know why <laughs> that grix is playing the tax two counter spell but uh yeah Maybe if Grixis gets pushed out... Yeah, make Disappear, thank you. Maybe if Grixis gets pushed out, this will see play. Vraska is the black Planeswalker right now. One Frexian, black mana, one black mana, four colorless. Six mana total. Potentially five if you pay two life. It is a six loyalty Planeswalker, and if it was cast for five and two life it is a four loyalty planeswalker which is pretty good completed so we already did that zero you draw a card and lose a life and proliferate so it's essentially a plus one but better that's fantastic already so for five mana you get a four loyalty proliferate you get a five loyalty that's not bad minus two target creature becomes a, a treasure artifact with a Tap, you can sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color, and it loses all card types and abilities. That's pretty good. And minus nine, if a player has fewer than nine poison counters, they get a number of poison counters equal to the difference. Okay. This is a card where you need context for the ult. Not that the ult necessarily matters, because it's kind of hard to get. You need four turns. Wait, proliferate? Yeah, you need four turns. So on your fourth turn, if it takes no damage... For six mana, you get the ults. If you have other prolific cards, you can speed it up, obviously. But uh, this is a very underwhelming ultimate without context of how good uh, Toxic is in set. Very, in my opinion, right now, if I had to guess, this ultimate is terrible. Nine poison counters means that if you have no direct way of inflicting poison counters, so like maybe there are some sorceries or instants that give poison counters. I don't know. This, or proliferate. Okay, if you have proliferate, then you can give them nine, and then proliferate and they die from the extra counter you give them. Hmm. Still, probably shouldn't be evaluated off of the ult. Okay. I feel like this is impossible to evaluate. Because proliferate is such a strong ability that depending on what you can use that on, so if it's affecting other parts of your board, then this is extremely valuable. I don't know if you have like creatures with plus one, plus one counters. Uh, I don't really know what else. Maybe other walkers that could be interesting. Yeah, this card is really interesting. Like the, the, the zero is very strong in my opinion. Draw a card and prolific. That's like fantastic value already. Uh, you are losing quite a bit of life if you're casting it for five, but I think you want to cast this for five most of the time. But then if you can cast it for six, of course you'll cast it for six. The minus two is very strong, I think. Oh, is it though? Uh, it's so complicated because right now in this meta, the minus two would not be that good because if you're considering the best deck, that would be Grixis. And they have absurd mana usage. Like, their ability to use all their mana every turn is unparalleled right now. And giving them that treasure and removing like one of their useless creatures other than maybe Shield Red, it's worth it. If you hit Shield Red, it's worth it. But like removing a 3 3 Appraiser or a Fable or Kiki Jiki, Harvester, those are all those are all not great targets. And you will have to give them that treasure if you're playing it. Because most of the time against Grixis, you won't really have a board state. They can remove a lot of your stuff. So on its face right now, this doesn't seem very good if we're playing it in this current meta. Obviously we aren't, because it's going to be a new meta. But 
right now, I, I would say it has potential. But it seems a little bit difficult to defend right now, as I see it. Like, uh, it doesn't defend itself very well. Jace, the Perfect Mind, is the newest Planeswalker that was revealed. Uh, the Perfected Mind. Four mana Planeswalker. Okay, that's already kind of scary. Four mana blue Planeswalker. Potentially three mana with the one Phyrexian blue mana. And it comes in with three loyalty. If you pay, if you pay three. And a uh, two life. Or for four, uh, four mana, it is five loyalty. Plus one up until your next turn, up to one target creature gets minus three, minus O. Oh, so essentially defending itself pretty well early game. That's fantastic. Minus two target player builds three cards. Then if a graveyard has 20 or more cards in it, you draw three cards. Otherwise, you draw a card. I mean, drawing three cards is absurd, but uh, 20 or more cards in your graveyard. Jesus. And then uh, the minus X is target player mills three times X cards. Jeez. So it can come in and mill 15, which is not great. Uh, for four, it can come in. For three, it's also not great. I mean, drawing a card and milling three is are is okay, but for minus two, I don't think that's very good. Usually, that's like a zero or a minus one at most. Hmm. Yeah, this is this is gonna be hard because right now, graveyard strategies are nearly unplayable with Hearse in the format, like fully graveyard strategies. And this doesn't seem like a card that you just play like appraiser. That's just unconditionally good. This needs setup. Sometimes you so you want to mill yourself because sometimes you don't you don't want to mill your opponent if they're playing a deck that can use it. And you know, this is huh. I don't think this is good enough right now. At least uh, not unless something changes drastically. Uh, in standard, at least. Of course, I'm reading all of these for standard. Did I mention that at the start? I don't remember, but hopefully I did. Jace makes cut down better, but in historic, Jace is a win con. Yeah, Jace makes cut down better, but. I mean, does that actually matter too much? I, I mean, it's pretty good. It's not bad because it has so much starting loyalty. Like for four mana, it, it will definitely protect itself, it will not die. I think the problem is I feel like you're stuck plussing for a while here. I don't think it's a bad card. I just think this is pretty outpaced in standard, I feel like. like against Grixis, I don't think this does much. And against Soldiers, they have Thalia, which is a nightmare for this thing. They have too, too much of a wide board state too. So like most of the best decks right now have a way of dealing with this pretty easily. and It's not that threatening. It's not like it's taking over. It's not like Lily, where you slam Lily, you make them sack a creature, and then you make them discard, which is like really pushing your advantage. But this is like stall the board, maybe stall again, maybe draw a card. Like you can leave this on the board and wait for your Invoke Despair and then nuke it with Invoke essentially. Again, I'm I'm evaluating I'm evaluating it for standard. In the current context of uh, me not knowing exactly what's coming with the with the set, so potential, but seems on the weaker side right now of uh, of things. Soldiers is gonna die. I I don't know. I haven't seen enough to say whether or not it's gonna die. But I feel I feel a little bit underwhelmed. But I'd rather feel underwhelmed than. See a, see a Planeswalker being, like, completely disgusting. Yeah, it seems to be... Right now, as, it see, as I see it, this requires a lot of setup, and that setup is pretty much hard countered by Hearse already, and that's not a good sign. Hearse is a fantastic card. 
And Hearse actually hard counters this because you cannot minus 3, minus 0 it, so it can also get crewed uh, by the next creature they play and attack this directly, which is also not good. It's not good against Bankbuster either. Like, Bankbuster on 2, like, just hitting it for 4 every turn, that's not great. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah, everybody thought Obnix was crazy, but hardly gets played. But that's different. Obnix looked like it would be insane because it affects the board in a way that seems meaningful. But this doesn't. This seems to be more of like a, I'm trying to set up my game plan type of planeswalker, not like pushing your opponent into like a, a position where they have to, like, they have to start panicking. You know, like this is kind of a slow card. Anyways, usually these don't do that much unless the format lends itself to it. Kaito, Dancing Shadow, Demir, Planeswalker, 4 mana, 3 loyalty, with a static. Whenever one or more creatures you control deals combat damage to a player, you may return one of them to its owner's hand. If you do, you may activate loyalty abilities of Kaito twice this turn rather than once. So if you deal damage, bounce a creature back to your hand, you get to activate twice. Plus 1. Up to one target creature can't attack or block until your next turn, so it can disable a blocker. That's fantastic for an ability like this already with a static. Zero, draw a card. So essentially you're trying to play enter the battlefield effects, bounce them back to your hand, disable their blocker so you can attack through, bounce it, draw a card, or make a, uh, make a 2 2. So you can zero draw a card or minus two, make a 2 2 with that touch. And whenever this creature leaves the battlefield, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life, which is actually really good. Uh, if, I'm assuming you're playing a tempo deck, so a deck with counter spells and creatures, fast, kill your opponent. And the minus two is good reach. Like, it's it's good to have a Planeswalker that can also deal some sort of damage indirectly, not through damage. So this is a cool card because the minus two makes death touch, which is extremely good on defense. And if they remove it, you also get the drain. If it trades, you get the drain. Even if you bounce it with the ability, it gets the chain, but it gets the uh, death proc. But I mean, you don't really want to bounce it back to your hand. I guess it's a, it's a token. I like the card. I feel like for four mana, it might be a little bit on the expensive side though. Again, standard is very fast. As in, like you need to play the best card you can each turn. And I don't think this matches the power level of the current curve, which is Harvester, Fable, Shield Red, Invoke. But it has potential. I think this these abilities are good and the static is good, considering it's usually an upside if you have creatures that have entered the battlefield effects and you should be playing them if you're playing this. Good card. Stat ability is other creatures get minus one other the other one. Kaya, Intangible Slayer, is a seven mana planeswalker with no Phyrexian mana, so straight seven Orzov planeswalker. But it has hexproof. Which is actually good. Very good. Hexproof on a planeswalker is strong if you build around it. This resolves. You win the game against control decks. And that's pretty solid. And as you can see, as you'll see in a moment, this these abilities are extremely strong against control. Plus two. Opponent loses three, you gain three. That's very strong. So starting loyalty, if you plus, is eight. But on face value, it's six. For, so seven mana, six loyalty. You can go up to eight. Zero. Draw two, then each opponent may scry one. I mean, you just drew two. Who cares if they scry? That's pretty good. And minus three, exile target creature or enchantment. If it wasn't an aura, create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature with flying in addition to its other types. That's very good. Feature or enchantment, so it has a little bit of flexibility there. It's not non-land permanent, which would have been busted probably. <laughs> Uh, I can deal with Fable, I can deal with Wedding Announcement, I'm trying to think of like the additional things you can hit with this that would be nice. It can hit uh, Gix's Cruelty of Gix, I mean. But yeah, 
essentially extremely powerful planeswalker, a nightmare for control, but control is not a deck in standard. <laughs> and this costs seven mana against a counter spell meta game. Uh, this looks like a fun card to play, but uh, seven mana in a in a color combination that doesn't really ramp with either treasures or putting lands onto the battlefield. Uh, there's one, there's the restoration of a ganjo that can ramp you one, but yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I will have to put the uh, too expensive stamp on Kaya. I feel like. I wish it was playable, but unless again, again, unless we move away from a counterspell meta game with make disappear, but uh, I don't see make disappear getting worse. That's the problem. It's like it can only get better from here, and it's already a problem. But they can only have so many make disappears, so maybe I don't know. Again, if Grixis is the top dog, they can board in the gates as well, which is. Not the best thing ever. And this card isn't the best against Grixis because they do tend to go pretty wide in the mid game if, if they are um, not answered too well with a bunch of Fable tokens and shit. Not great. But a uh, cool card. Probably not great. Unfortunately. Maybe in a three color deck though with some kind of red or green to ramp it out potentially. I'm just looking at like some I kind of want to play it, so. <laughs> New Luca, Luca Bound to Ruin is a 5 mana, 5 loyalty, Gruel Planeswalker, but it has 1 Phyrexian red slash green mana. So you can essentially pay 4 mana and 2 life to get a 3 loyalty Planeswalker. Let's check it out. Plus 1, add green and red. Spend this mana only to cast creature spells or activate abilities of creatures. That is quite good. So assuming you paid four, it would go back up to four loyalty and it would give you two mana, allowing you to potentially remove something so it can protect itself or play a creature and block with it, which is not bad. For four mana, I feel like it's a little bit slow on the turn you cast it, but let's see what else it has. Create a 3-3 three, three Friction Beast creature token with Toxic 1. Toxic 1 is... Not good. As in, it doesn't actually affect combat. Assuming you played it four, it goes down to two loyalty with this effect, which is not great. Uh, yeah, this, this card doesn't defend itself that well with the 3-3, three, three, I would say. Depending on your board state, of course. If you have... I mean, I would assume if you're playing Gruul that you have... You played a two drop, you played a three drop. Maybe you play 4-drop and then you play this for 5 and then it's fine, right? Assuming you had a good curve out, it should be able to protect, protect itself. But then the question is, once you untap, is it good? Adding mana is definitely good. But, uh, are you not out of cards at that point, though? If you're out of cards, you're making 3-3s, three which is not bad. Honestly, if you can get one 3-3 three, three out on the turn it comes down and another 3-3 three, three on the next turn, that's pretty good. But then... You can't really mine this again. I mean, you could. But the turn after that, you're adding mana. Which at that point is probably not being used on anything. Because you don't have any cards in hand. So, the best way to use this would be with an activated ability. So you'd have to play a creature that has an activated ability that can use this. Let's check out the minus 4. Which is something you can use immediately if you cast this for 5. Luka deals X damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers where X is the greatest power among creatures you controlled as you activated the ability. Wow. So it has that little caveat with the as you activate the ability, which is fantastic. Assuming, I would assume, yeah, okay. Four is probably what you're getting on average. So your average is four. So minus four to deal four, divided as you choose among any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers. So very important, this can hit planeswalkers. That's actually good. But uh, you're not using this very often. In a desperate situation, ah, this is weird because 
if you're winning, this is insane. Because you curve out, you play four drop, you play this. If your four drops not answer, which is what the scenario I'm running through right now is you're winning on board. You play this, you're minus four, destroy their blocker, tech, base or planeswalker. They have no board essentially. You have your four drop at least. That's pretty good. And then the next turn. The problem is the next turn is not great, right? You're you're either sacking the Luca to make a 3-3, which is not great. Or you're plussing to maybe cast an expensive creature if you're playing into that kind of a deck building, but uh or you're spending it on nothing essentially. There'd be a four mana six six creature in a new set. Yeah, maybe there are a bunch of uh, expensive creatures and you're running this more so in like a big gruel. In that case, as long as you can use this ability more often, it's actually gaining a lot of value because uh, if you're plusing for nothing, essentially, if you have no cards in hand, then it's a little sketchy because you're only minusing for three threes, which is quite good. The first two turns it comes down, it's already really good, but then your plus is pretty much useless, right? Ramp the Elder Titan. Yeah, I'm thinking about Elder, uh, the um, yeah Titan of uh, Industry, right? So you play this, untap Titan, that's good. With Fable as well, so considering you can do like Fable, Luca, Titan, and potentially activate Fable the turn you do that, if, if everything stays as is. But uh, will big gruel be a thing? That's that's what I'm thinking. I'm I'm more so seeing this in like aggressive gruel because aggressive gruel you can play around counter spells that way by just outpacing your opponent. But if you think about like a ramp a ramp deck again, make disappear. So the problem is you're you're slow, so they don't have to they don't have to play defensively too much. It'll be a lot slower. You're trying to like bring out the big creatures, so you're giving them more time. More time to find counter spells. Again, we're speaking about Grixis here, the, the best deck that might not be the best deck after the format, but right now I can only evaluate it with uh, the assumption that Grixis will still be the best deck because it's pretty insane. And if that's the case, I I don't know if this is... um Well, this is already a good Planeswalker against Grixis because you're making a 3-3 again. Any Planeswalker that can make a body is really good against Invoke. But I'm saying like the deck uh direction, as in big gruel i don't think it's going to be as good as like fast gruel like play the best creature you can on curve you don't need to go like into the seven drops you just play lower curve fast hit hard make three threes push your way through essentially i feel like that might be the better plan for uh, a metagame that that involves uh make disappear but we'll see good card though i like it the Hiri, the unforgiving is the Boros Planeswalker, so it has it's a four mana walker, five loyalty, one Phyrexian red white mana, so red slash white. So you can pay two life and three mana, and you have a three loyalty planeswalker. In comparison with the uh, Emperor, which one, the Wandering Emperor, <laughs> or uh, or this wander, uh, this wander. Oh wait, no, this is an Emperor anyways. So it's the Wandering Emperor. Oh wait, the Gruul Emperor? I don't even know what that is. Okay, anyways. The Hiri. Three mana, pay two life. You get a three loyalty plus one up to your, uh, until your next turn. Up to one target creature attacks player. Each combat if able to. It goes up to four loyalty. And it forces a creature to attack you and not the planeswalker that's really interesting so it does defend itself which is just super important for uh, cheap planeswalkers that makes them immeasurably more powerful than they would be otherwise i don't really like when planeswalkers can defend themselves and they're cheap but it is what it is that's pretty strong could force a bad block it can save this planeswalker from taking damage which is fantastic and it could potentially be a 4-mana 6-loyalty Planeswalker, which is insane, but there's no ult. Plus 1, discard a card, and then draw a card. I mean, for a plus, that's pretty good. If it was a 0, it would be pretty bad. Wow, it's actually crazy that this is a plus on a cheap Planeswalker. Okay, wow. 
That's, uh, yeah, that's fine. Flexibility. That's really good, actually. And zero exile target target creature equipment card with mana value less than Nahiri, Nahiri's loyalty from your graveyard. Target creature equipment card with mana value less than Nahiri's loyalty from your graveyard. Create a token that's a copy of it. That token gains haste, but you exile it at the beginning of the next end step. I mean, this doesn't have, like, any real board presence or card advantage, per se, attached to it. That's kind of interesting. But there are some new equipment cards that summon tutus and equip those tutus. So what happens, what happens with that? Like, what if you bring out the equipment and it attaches to the tutu? Does that token gain haste? I don't think it does, right? So what, I don't really understand the whole equipment part of this card, because you still have to equip the equipment, right? It doesn't, I don't really understand why it doesn't equip, it, why doesn't it say if you bring back an equipment, equip it to a creature for free, right? Or something like that. I feel like having to pay the equipment cost is a little bit weird, but on a cheap planeswalker, I guess, why not? I mean, it already does a lot. It doesn't affect the board that much. A little bit. Forcing like bad blocks or bad attacks into your blockers. But are you really looking to block with a card like this? I don't know. This is, yeah, it, from what I'm thinking, it definitely feels like a combo card of some kind. A combo setup it's like stalling for some kind of combo discard draw getting your opponent to attack you instead of the planeswalker so it keeps like gaining some value and then eventually bring back something bam creature attacks it's got to be a creature right bring back creature so this is like a ah but it can't bring back oh it's weird because it can't bring back things that have more cmc that's loyalty so this is a weird card yeah as it stands without looking at the equipment i can't really evaluate this card so unfortunately if you know better than me go ahead and comment down below and tell me what i'm missing with this card but it does seem to be good if the right cards are there to support it but even then, I, can, I can't really see this seeing play outside of like a, a deck that's really built around it, which is kind of interesting. But there might be something here. It is powerful for the mana cost overall, I would say. But in a, in a weird way, like a very niche way. Like it looks like it's doing very specific things for a specific goal. So yeah, the hard to value. Last but not least, or maybe last but least, I don't know, we'll see. Tivar, Jubilant Brawler. Three mana, three mana Planeswalker, wow, okay. Three mana Golgari Planeswalker, three loyalty, which is reasonable. And you may activate abilities of creatures you control as though those creatures had haste. And plus one is untap up to one target creature. Minus two is mill three cards. You may return a creature with mana value two or less from the graveyard to the battlefield. All right, this is really good but probably not in standard but uh, from having played some of the other formats this does sound like uh this does sound like it would do a lot for three mana and i don't want to play against it in those formats <laughs> but i don't feel like in standard this will have pretty much any impact at all unless again uh, unless the new cards are really really strong when it comes to activated abilities. Sneaky haste. Yeah, but you don't in a in a fable deck, you don't want this too much. I mean it, it's fine. Getting Harvester back is good. 
But on the three drop slot, the three drop slot is extremely contested already. And in Jund, the deck is already kind of built. The deck is there's no room for extra cards in the Jund deck. And it's not even good enough right now, so I don't think this makes it good enough suddenly because you can use Harvester immediately or Fable immediately. Even untapping in Jund is not great. Like you're talking about Harvester that sacks itself, so you can't really untap it's dead. And then uh Fable, that's pretty damn good though. But still, this doesn't Ah, there is some card advantage, obviously, with the return. But it's not it's not really progressing your main strength in Jund, which is ramping its Titan or Cruelty of Gix or something like that. But uh, if there's some sort of a ramp deck that uses like a creature that taps for mana, which we do have in Standard, but I don't, I don't even know. I don't know. I, I can't really think of how you would build a deck like this. That wouldn't get wrecked by Grixis or a deck, any deck with enough removal spells to simply like. I guess what's interesting is that they kill your two drop. You play this, you bring it back, and it can activate its mana ability immediately. That, like that's kind of good. And then they have to kill it again, or else you tap it for two mana the next turn. I mean, this card's good. This card's this card's super strong. And it's in green, so Hearse is, like, answerable. It's not... Yeah, I mean, you have an Infernal... Uh, what is it? Unleashed the Infernal and Terror. With the Nyx land, it's in test. It's intense. What do you mean, the Nyx land? What is this? Rust, Rustvine Cultivator? Is this a new... Uh, is this a new creature? Oh, yeah, it is. So, Phyrexian green? Is it? Is it actually a Phyrexian green mana? I can't tell. It's kind of scuffed. It's a green, right? Okay, green. Tap, put an oil counter on Rustvine Cultivator. Tap, remove an oil counter from Rustvine Cultivator. Untap target land. Okay, so this is not for standard, right? But Oh, I see what you're saying. Like the Nyx. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't even know if that's going to be good enough, but... I want to use it with priests. Of... Yeah, I know a lot of people are looking forward to... Um... Priest of Forgotten Gods in Exploria. I, I've seen Ash Lizzle talk about that one, and it does seem pretty busted. Yeah, I, I'm talking about for standard, obviously. Like, I'm evaluating this for standard, and in standard, it, ha it still has potential. That, that's kind of what's scary, is that two-drop ramp creature, they want to kill it. They kill it, you bring it back, you can tap it immediately, which is usually not going to do much. You're tapping it for one green. What are you going to do with one green? Probably nothing. But you still have a Planeswalker, and you still have a creature that they have to answer again, or else you're tapping it for two mana on turn four, which means you can go up to six mana, which is pretty good. And assuming you're playing a deck that can take advantage of that mana, which you should be. You have Titan, which you can't cast, unfortunately. But uh, maybe a six drop. If you had a six drop, it would be like really sick. But I don't know if there are many many six drops really. The black hole for historic. Yeah, this seems really scary for other formats. That's what that's what I'm saying. I'm glad I'm, I don't usually play those. <laughs> Double blood token. That's a standard uh, blood scythe. Kill two two, then kill four four. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, yeah, it's not it's not bad. But is it is it actually good enough? Because again, you, you have to think about standard. The three drop slot is insane right now. Like Fable. Even the weaker three drops are insane. So you got Fable wedding announcement. You've got uh, the appraiser. You've got uh, graveyard trespasser. Even like cards that even removal spells like the best removal spell. Or one of the best removal spells in standard right now is. Uh, Soul transfer, right? That's also in a three drop slot, which is uh, insane. But I guess maybe in green and black, it's a little bit less contested. I don't know if green has a good three drop, really. It will, I think, in the upcoming set. But uh, if you're just playing pure Golgari, well, I guess you wouldn't because you were talking about Harvester. So if you're playing Jund, would you want to play this? No, you wouldn't. Again, 
I think the problem is people are thinking perfect world, right? Perfect world, you have a harvester that gets milled or is in the graveyard. But a Jund deck uses its ramp and its card advantage to play bigger things, right? So you're not going to be playing that many two drops. So for you to hit a two drop, but I guess you're talking about a, a theoretical Jund deck that plays a bunch of two drops. But I don't think that would be strong enough in, in a metagame where Brotherhood's End is the thing, really. Like, Grixis doesn't really have to commit onto the board. You play this. I guess it goes to four loyalty. That's pretty important. But uh, you would also have to use, like, mana dwarfs. Because plus untap a creature, you have to make sure you're able to use that. And in a Jun deck with a bunch of two drops, there aren't that many activated abilities. Unless it's mana abilities, but if you're using mana abilities to ramp, then you need bigger spells. And if you have bigger spells, you don't have as many two drops. So it's the balance is not great. The balance is I don't think standard has enough support to make a deck that's full of two drops that can also use this untap ability. That's what I'm saying. Like it doesn't have priest, like effects that are card advantage and other, not just untap for mana. Because if you're untapping for mana, you want bigger stuff. And you can't really play bigger stuff and still think to hit this uh this ability on average bankbuster doesn't uh does not return bankbuster that would be interesting but still oh you can use bankbuster mana sure yeah you can play four bankbuster maybe untap creature though it doesn't really untap bankbuster unless you crew it and then untap it which is kind of awkward just spending four mana i don't know it sounds to me like this could see play in standard, but I don't really, right now, can't envision a deck with it as it stands. But uh, again, I haven't gone through the whole set, so we'll see. Maybe there's like a, there's a Jun deck or a Golgari deck that can use this really efficiently already in standard, but I don't think this is made, this was made for standard. I think it's more of like a card that's like crazy in other formats. That's, uh, that's the entire point, probably. But yeah, that's going to do it. I'm pretty excited to review like the actual set. Whoops, I'm moving it around. <laughs> but yeah, I'm looking forward to reviewing the, the actual set because it seems like a lot of these cards need some kind of other support to uh, round them out and make them better than they seem at first glance. So pretty interesting stuff overall. A lot of mechanics that are very narrow. Not this one, but... Yeah, mostly this and the uh, Nahiri. The Brass guy is kind of interesting. And this is like, this is kind of a joke if you're asking me. Favorite, favorite Planeswalker out of the 10? Favorite Planeswalker out of the 10? I, I think I'd have to say Eternal Wanderer. I, I actually love the, I uh, actually really like it. It's either Eternal Wander or Kaya for me. I feel like I have more chances of just playing Eternal Wander over Kaya, so. But I like Hexproof. I like destroying decks that can't answer this. That would be fun. This just seems like a really good card to me, but it's gonna be in the sideboard unless Grixis is not in the format. <laughs> this seems really strong. Like, imagine there's a. Imagine Mono Green gets more popular. As some people think it might become with the Thruin and stuff. Like, this shit is a uh, nightmare for Mono Green, I feel like. <laughs> if you're playing a deck that's playing like Ow, Sanctuary Warden, even like, so any non blue mid range matchup, this is like a nightmare, I feel like. The sack effect already is really nasty. But uh, I don't know. I just I just like what this does. I really like the, uh, the claws, like, no. The static is cool. I, I think the plus is what's really, really interesting to me. Like, this plus is so versatile. Whether it be defensively, just like defensively removing one of your opponent's creatures or flickering your own to get more value out of, uh, out of your own creatures. Like, uh, Sanctuary Warden, attack. Use both shield counters up, flicker, bring it back, 
eat a loyalty from this maybe like there's a lot you can do you know seems like uh it's also theoretical vigilance it, it just does it it does a lot it does a lot and I'll, i like that it has like a bailout pseudo sweeper which is kind of kind of cool Way more balanced than the Wandering Emperor. <laughs> can we, uh, yeah, can we not design cards like the Wandering Emperor anymore? That would be cool. But yeah, anyways, I'm gonna leave you all with that. Hope you enjoyed the vid. See you in the next one.